Thanks for tuning into our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. If you have any questions or want a little bit more info on anything going on here at Coastal, check out our website at ccoceancity.com. Today, Matthew will be continuing a study through the book of Philippians. So without further ado, here's Matthew. So as they are collecting the offering, we are going to do something that may have never, ever, 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 ever been done in the history of Coastal Christian. And it's going to be covering an entire chapter, literally every single verse, one verse at a time. We are actually going backwards in order to go forward. This is what I believe, and I believe this with all my heart. I believe, of course, as we've titled Philippians 1, 1 through 30, it's time to review to renew. Now, here's why. I believe we are so excited, of course, to gather on any given Sunday, any given Thursday, and we get these messages, right? And then we go right on to the next one. And it's like, man, we are moving so quick. Sometimes we need to pause and do a review. Why? Here's why. Memorization is the offspring of repetition. Let me say that again. Memorization is the offspring of repetition. It's the reason why we could actually sing a song that comes on the radio every single day. We don't even realize that we're so exposed to it. The lyrics are actually imprinting on my mind, memorization, that when the song comes back on, I can sing it, repeat it. I believe the same applies in scripture. The more we're exposed to it, That's why it's so crucial for the young ones in here to take time to memorize scripture. Here's what happens. Repetition, reading and reading and studying and studying, for me personally, leads to memorization. And memorization leads to contemplation, meditation. And all of that literally helps me with practical application. In the midst of a very trying conflict or a circumstance, if I'm meditating on God's word, I'm more likely to deal with that situation with patience rather than frustration. So there's something to it. So we are actually going to go into verse 1 all the way through 30. If you've been with us from the beginning, again, I'm going to remind you the title of the message. I'm going to touch on a few points, and then on the screen is going to show up what I'm going to call the deduction. And what I've deduced is important out of that passage. So here we go. And I want to encourage you, please, do what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn to Philippians chapter 1, and I'm going to read directly out of the Word of God. And I'm doing this unorthodox, and usually you guys see me uh, teach a certain way. I'm actually going to hold the Word of God in my hand the entire time, so I would encourage you to do the same. And when I go into the book, you go into the book. Let's do that together. Lord, bless your Word. Bless the administration. Lord, bless the reception. Amen. Acts 16, 6 through 40, we covered what was called the people of the epistle because we read, let me read it, first Verse, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And we stop and we say, who are the you that Paul is writing to? And you discover the you are the people of Philippi. We learn who they are in Acts chapter 16. It begins when Paul and his missionary team, which is made up of Silas, which is made up of Luke, which is made up of Timothy. And they're making their way, get this, to Asia. Yet the Bible is very specific and it says that the Holy Spirit forbade them. Interesting. The Holy Spirit shut a door. Their intended plan was to go that way, yet the Holy Spirit said, no, I need you to go that way. They had no clue where they were going to end up. They eventually end up in Philippi. It is a city in Macedonia. It's named after a man named Philip of Macedonia, who was just so happened to be the father of Alexander the Great. It's a Roman colony. This is important to understand. There are a lot of military vets that have found their home in Philippi. Now, when Paul went there, he intended to find a group of men. A group of 10 Jewish men would constitute the ability to found a synagogue. But when he gets there, there's no synagogue. So he goes to where there would be a place of prayer, and guess what he finds? Women. One woman specifically is highlighted. Her name's Lydia. Lydia was a lady of purple dye, which means she was a fluent because that was a very expensive color in their day. Now watch this. This is interesting. She is so open to hear the gospel. She believes in God, 
but she's unsure about Jesus. Paul actually opens up the gospel to her, probably makes sense of her faith, her belief, and it says that God opened up her heart. And then she takes them back to her house. Her heart opens up, and she opens up her home. Then Paul and Silas, they make their way into town, and of course, they cast out a demon from a young girl, which gets them into some trouble. They eventually find themselves in front of a civil magistrate, and they find them actually guilty. They put them in a holding cell. In the holding cell, they beat them. But it's in the holding cell. Watch this. They end up in a place where they should not have been, jail, which means God had to open even that door to get them there. Hmm, bet you never thought of it that way. Sometimes God will open up those type of doors to bring you to a place you don't want to be because he has a divine appointment for you to meet somebody that is in that place. And who was it? The jailer. Long story short, earthquake because they're praising, the shackles fall off, the jailer's about to kill himself, and he doesn't because Paul says, don't do it. He then runs and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? It's an amazing question. Then Paul actually says, let me tell you about Jesus. How do you be saved? You believe in Jesus Christ. God opens his heart and he opens up his doors and they bring Paul and Silas back to their home. This is amazing to me. This is what I've deduced. This is the point. Only God can open doors to enter hearts. And only God can open hearts to enter doors. Do you see that? He opens up one woman's heart. She opens up her doors to bring them in, which is the beginning of the church at Philippi. Then God opens up the doors to jail. And then he opens up the heart of a jailer and he opens up his doors. You see how the gospel is making its way into locations and places that it otherwise would not have. This is amazing. When we open up our hearts, God, use me. He will use your open heart to enter a place that typically would not receive the gospel. It could be a workplace. It could be a relationship or a family dynamic. As we continue, watch this, Philippians 1, 1 through 3. Again, Paul and Timothy, who are they? Paul is an apostle. Paul comes to Christ after he was once a persecutor of the church. Timothy is his mentor. They identify themselves as bond servants. What is a bond servant? Simple. It's a slave by choice. There were slaves by force, and a bond slave or a bond servant was a slave by choice. They had a ritual. When a slave was going to be set free, but they wanted to stay with their master because they fell in love with the family. Think about that. They fell in love with the master and his household. They said, you know what? I don't want to go. I want to stay. And the master would pierce the ear of the slave. And symbolically, of course, the open ear for us as servants of God. How do you know somebody's a servant of God? They have an open ear. Speak to me, Lord. That's like the first characteristic of a Christian. They have an ear to hear what the Lord has to say. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Remember, we talked about saints aren't dead. There's a whole denomination built on the fact that sainthood happens after they die and we beautify people and then we pray to them. And that's not biblical, church. That's not biblical. Can't find it anywhere in the scriptures. Saints are you and I. I see St. Linda sitting over there. A saint is one who is set apart, one who is made holy. That's why every time Paul mentions saints, he's talking about the believers. We are all saints in Christ. Bishops and deacons are overseers and servants in the church. Grace to you, peace from our God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the point? I see the, 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 the fact of being a bond slave, how important it is. How important it is to serve one another. You know, I am convinced from all of the conversations that I get into, all the counseling, all the advisements, my journeys and meeting people, I've, I've, I've come to this conclusion that a lot of the people that struggle with life, they struggle with problems, they struggle with a circumstance, are those that are only focused on themselves. And when you're focused on yourself, you're not focused on others. When you're focused on yourself, you're focused on the things that aren't going your way. But here's the key. The moment you start focusing on other people, you forget about yourself. I'm not saying your problems will erase, but I'm saying the more I focus on you and serve you, hey, let me be honest, 55 months in hell, state prison for me, felt like 55 days. You wanna know why? 
because I was intentional and deliberate in saying, Lord, not my will, not my rights, yours. And I started serving everybody around me. And the more I served, the more the days and the weeks and the months and the years literally passed. And I look back and I say, goodness gracious, because that's what it was, his goodness and his grace. So when you serve other people, the focus leaves you and it goes on to either God or other people. So we need to be bond slaves. Here's the point. The mark of Christ in our lives is seen most radically in the way we serve others. In the way we serve others. You don't want to know the way the world will see the Lord. The clearest way for the world to see the Lord is when you start serving people with no expectation of reward. It's just when you just start doing for others. And they, hey, can I give you something? No, I just wanted to help out. There are a million ways to serve. Verses 1 through 3, we continue with verses 3 through 8. The message was titled, way back when, when we did it, The Sanctification of Suffering. Verse 3 to 8, let's read. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Remember, Paul's focused on them, not himself. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Remember, he founded the church 10 years prior. He met people like Lydia. He met the jailer. And the church began to thrive and flourish. He then says to them, be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Are you seeing the theme here? He's in jail and he's focused on them. He's thinking about them. Inasmuch as both in my chains and in defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. I see a lot going on here. Remember, I chose the title, The Sanctification of Suffering, way back when, because I see Paul's the one confined. He's writing an epistle from prison. And he's focused on them. He says, I'm praying for you. My joy is connected to your well-being. Not only am I thinking about you, but don't worry about me. You know why they were worried about him? Because when he first founded the church with them, do you remember there was a divine jailbreak? Do you remember there was given vindication in front of the civil magistrates? Now Paul's back in jail. You better believe they're thinking God's going to get him out. It'll turn out the same way it did when he was with us. So they're saying, Paul, is your incarceration, your circumstances, hindering God's work? And Paul's saying, are you crazy? My circumstances are actually advancing God's work. In fact, my chains, he says, God is using them so I can defend the gospel. Now, this is not an argument. When we say defend the gospel, it's not an argument. The word defense means apologia. It's actually more so visual when you do the research. How do you defend the gospel? You live it. And when people see that you're living it, that's defending that it is real, that it's true. And then he says the confirmation of the gospel, which means every time he stood on the truth, God confirmed the truth. Out of this, of course, them worrying, is God's work going to be abandoned because the apostle is locked up? And that's what we usually think when something does not go our way, church. Please hear me on this. When something goes wrong, when the child goes wayward, when we lose the loved one, when the condition or sickness comes back, we often think, God has abandoned me. And I'm saying, not only has he not abandoned you, he cannot abandon his work. Once he starts it, he has to finish it. It's his nature. He cannot contradict his nature. So here's the main point. Be confident that he who has done a good work for you will also complete the good work within you. What's the good work that he's done for us? Jesus. He gave us his all when he gave us his son. It actually says, he who did not spare his own son. The father did not spare his own son. Hey, dad's in here. Would you be willing to give up your son to save an enemy? Think about that. I wouldn't. I would not give up an offspring to save an enemy. That's what God did. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not, with Jesus, be willing to give us all things? In other words, the things that he gives us are always for our absolute good. The things that he keeps from us are always for our absolute good. 
Sometimes I say, why aren't you answering my prayer this way? And he goes, because it's not good for you. And a good father knows that. The good work that he's done for us, sacrificing Jesus, the cross, if he's done that good work for me, I can trust he's going to complete the good work within me. Now, let me say this very quickly. The good work that he wants to do within you often takes certain circumstances that are happening outside of you. And the certain circumstances that are happening outside of us, we often don't like. Again, God uses the craziest ingredients in his economy. I say this frequently because I want it to be sticky. I want you to memorize it so I repeat it. No matter the good, the bad, the ugly, it all has purpose in God's economy. And sometimes the things outside of us that are happening, God is using the outside circumstances to develop an inside character. Verses three through eight, of course, the sanctification of suffering. Then verses nine through 11, the boundaries of abounding love, if you remember this one. And this I pray, he gets specific. Earlier he said, I'm praying for you. Now he says, this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. And we stop. The word abound means to overflow. To overflow and grow. His prayer is, I want your love to keep growing. But it's not out of control love. See, a lot of times the world or the culture will say that we are to gushy, mushy love. And the gushy, mushy love is we're to love everyone and everything no matter what. The word is tolerance. But let me tell you something. Biblical love has nothing to do with tolerance and everything to do with obedience. Because sometimes I love you so much, I got to tell you the truth. Sometimes you have to confront a brother or sister in Christ. And the love that tolerates sin usually overlooks it and ignores it at that person's soul's expense. So if you really love someone, consider it. Wouldn't it be more loving to tell them? So love that grows and grows has boundaries. And the boundaries come in the very next two words, in knowledge and discernment. See, love in knowledge is, knowledge is intimate, it's genuine, it's authentic knowledge, it's the knowledge that you get to know when you get close to Jesus. It's the knowledge that you feel, that you experience. It's the more I get close to Jesus, the more knowledge I have of Jesus, the more I know him intimately. This is not an intellectual knowledge. This is not me reading books and memorizing it and literally having it up here. This is a knowledge that actually gets in here. It's knowing someone. When you know someone, how do you know them? You spend time with them. You pick up their idiosyncrasies. You actually start talking like they do. You start laughing like they do. It's because you spend time with them. I'm going to be that type of person that spends so much time with Jesus. I start talking like him. I start walking like him. And of course, I start looking like him. That's knowledge. My love grows, but it has knowledge, the boundary of knowledge, and then discernment. Discernment is this. It's when your eyesight, what you see, lines up with your insight and what you know. So you need the knowledge, knowing God, to have proper, the word is discernment. You know what discernment is? It's knowing the difference between right and wrong, light and dark, truth and error, life and death. And when your love grows with the boundaries of knowledge and discernment, we can come to the conclusion that you can approve, verse 10, the things that are excellent. What does that mean? The word approve means to test the quality of. And the reason why I want to test the quality of the things in my life, because I want to find out what has vitality. I test the quality to discover its vitality and whether or not it's excellent for me. You don't want to know why? You could choose what's good, but if it's not what's best, that good becomes what's worst. Because you could choose the good all of your life. What do I mean? I could choose to do something that's considered good, it's not sinful. It might be idle, could be just watching TV. That's fine. But how about I take that same time and choose what's excellent? I approve what's excellent. I spend it praying for the people in my life. I read the scriptures. I do something that is considered excellent. It's very, very hard. I get that. But when we get in Jesus, we learn what to approve. And then when we learn what to approve, it then says, guess what you become? 
sincere. The word is sincera, means without wax. It means without actual cracks or fractures. It is actually talking about pottery, that they would actually seal the cracks with wax and then paint it and then sell it. And then it would get to the person who purchased it and it would actually be exposed that it was faulty. So they started to post signs or postages on it saying, Sincera, this is without wax. This is authentic. So let me define sincerity for you. Sincerity is inward righteousness. Because next it says, you will be without offense. Look, you'll learn what to approve. That is excellent. And then you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. Without offense is blameless. Without offense is external righteousness. Sincerity is internal righteousness. Without offense is external righteousness. Let me explain. Let me illustrate. Tax collectors and prostitutes, they were actually sincere. They were broken on the inside. But if brokenness does not lead to repentance, it can't lead to outward righteousness. So they can't just have an inward sincerity then they won't become without offense, blameless, because they'll continually end their path and their lifestyle of sin. Does that make sense? The other side, without offense, you know who was without offense? The Pharisees. They were externally righteous, yet they weren't sincere. They were stricklers to the law. If you saw them, you said, wow, they're holy, they're righteous. They were externally righteous. They were without offense. You couldn't blame them for anything. They kept the law to a T. That's why we need both. We need to be inwardly righteous, of course that's Jesus, and externally blameless. Here's external blameless. It's when people can't point at you and blame you for anything. Not that you're perfect, but when things go wrong, nobody can come alongside and go, I think it was him, I think it was her. Blamelessness can only happen when you're connected to Jesus. So when we, of course, get closer to Jesus, the clearer we recognize excellence and the more we become blameless. That word blameless, it's like missing in the church. You know why? Because we're so easy, not only on people making mistakes and sinning. Now, I'm not talking about not giving grace. I'm talking about what it takes to be blameless. I'm talking about how we are so let me make sure I word this correctly. We so easily don't allow people, we so easily don't call it like it is in church. When somebody makes a mistake, when they slip up, instead of actually correcting and calling out, that's what we're, we're here for, which leads to blamelessness. We excuse it. We so easily offer excuses for everything. There's no more accountability. There's no more responsibility. It's always like, oh, it's just the way I'm wired, man. It's just my upbringing, man. I can't change the way I speak, man. I'm no, you can. We're called to it. We're called to sincerity. Jesus in my heart. I'm called to being blameless. I, that's a challenge. I, I say this not because I'm perfect. I say it because I love Jesus. I challenge people to see me out there in this community where you can actually find me doing something I shouldn't be doing or treating somebody the way I shouldn't be treating them. That's blameless. And that's not about me. That's about Jesus. That's how it was in prison. Conducting yourself with such blameless. It's the word's integrity. Students, when people see you in your class, oh, that person's a Christian? And then we're right there in the midst of the gossip and the slander, right there in the midst of talking bad about another student. That's not blameless. And yes, they might call you stuffy and stiff, but blamelessness requires you to be connected to Jesus because the next part says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which is character, which are by Jesus Christ alone to the glory and praise of God. Verses 12 to 14. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I love this section. So that has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. We titled this chain reaction 
because of the amount of times Paul mentions his chains. He's saying, don't worry about my chains. They have actually led to the furtherance of the gospel. I'm actually in contact with the lost. He was able to actually convert palace guard officers who gave him access, the gospel, into the Roman Empire, into the emperor's house. Remember, if Paul went to this place as a preacher, he would not have had the same impact. That's why God said, I'm going to have to lock you up again, Paul, and give you access with the gospel to reach people that you would not have otherwise reached. His chains, or let me replace his chains with his situation, his emotion, his affliction. Somebody in here, your occupation. Somebody in here is chained to a relation. And the chain should give you contact to the lost. And the other part, his chain inspired or gave courage to the saved. Did you, did you catch that? Those on the outside are becoming more confident because of Paul's chains to speak about Jesus. You know what they were saying? Paul's in trouble, so we're not gonna speak about the gospel because if you speak about the gospel, you can get in trouble too. But this guy who's in trouble for speaking about the gospel is now preaching even more. And they're hearing about that and they're saying, hold up a second, if he could do it in there, I could do it out here. And it created like a revival outside of the prison walls for people to be more bold about Jesus. Here's what we deduce. Every chain comes with a choice. You can consecrate it or you can complain about it. To consecrate your chains is to give God that circumstance that you feel you're chained to, that affliction that you feel you're locked up to, that circumstance or relationship that you feel like you're stuck in. You can complain about it and look for ways out of it, or you could say, God, consecrate it. Consecration is God, here it is for you to separate and use for your glory. Where even Paul's chains, I love this, physical chains, God was using the same way he used David's slingshot, the same way he used a horn and a trumpet and pitchers in the hands of Gideon, the same way he used a rod in the hands of Moses. You give these things to God, I don't care what it is. And he says, I wanna use that. We consecrate it, it comes with a choice, or of course we complain about it. Verses 15 through 18, we are halfway there. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. What's happening here? There are people outside of the jail who are taking advantage of Paul's absence. They're preaching Christ from a spirit of competition. They're not anti-Christ, they're anti-Paul. Let me say that again. They are not against Christ, they are against Paul. They are spreading rumors that Paul's in trouble for actually stirring up chaos, and that's why he's locked up. But they're still preaching Jesus. Now there's the other camp that's preaching Christ from goodwill. This is what Paul says. The former, they preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. They're, they're wanting to add pressure to my circumstance. You got people in your life that are doing that? They're adding pressure to your already stressful circumstances. They're, they're adding weight, that's the word affliction. They are adding more stress to your circumstances. They're not helping. They believe in Jesus, they talk about him too, but they're not helping you. Paul would say, the latter is doing it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So here we go, Paul, what's your response to those that are actually criticizing you, even though they're preaching Christ? Are you gonna defend yourself, Paul? Are you gonna to respond to them? You should. Don't let them treat you like that. You deserve to talk back to them because that's how they're treating you. That's really what we are told. But that's not what Paul does. What then? You want me to answer? I will answer. Only that in every way, whether in pretense, hypocrisy, or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. What is he saying? Matt, they're talking about you. You know where you're from down in Cape May? It's where I was raised. They're talking bad about you. Who cares? As long as Christ is being preached, who cares? 
hey, as long as they're talking bad about me, but they're talking about God's redemption in my life, who cares? As long as God has given glory, who cares? That's what Paul's saying. He said, as long as Jesus is being preached, how did he come to that conclusion? I believe he kept his eyes on Jesus. And because you keep your eyes on Jesus, you don't have ears for your critics. You don't have ears for your haters. When you keep your eyes on the prize, that's Jesus Christ, you cannot be silenced by violence. When our eyes are set on Jesus, you cannot be silenced by violence. Now I'm talking about verbal violence. You cannot be stopped by hindrance. Somebody that's trying to hinder God's work in your life cannot be stopped when you keep your eyes on Jesus and you cannot be seduced by annoyance. You know, that's the biggest one. We're like seduced by the things that annoy us. What do I mean seduce? It like completely mesmerizes us. It takes all of our attention off of our peace and our purpose when somebody comes into our life and annoys us, doesn't it? Yes. I can't stand this person. And God's like, really? Put your eyes on me and you won't have time to hear them. Paul continues, verses 19 to 21. This was a two-parter when we once did it. 19 says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. He's saying the word deliverance isn't actual physical deliverance. Let me digress because a lot of times we believe physical deliverance from a trouble, from a problem, from a circumstances is what gets God the greatest glory. But I don't believe so, not from scriptures. I believe sometimes if God can deliver us physically from a circumstance, of course we'll get glory. But I believe the greater glory is accomplished when we allow God to deliver us in the circumstance. That's what Paul's saying. He said, I believe, my faith is confident that one day God will vindicate me. I don't have to justify myself. I don't have to explain myself to anyone. I am right in God's sight. God will vindicate me. God will, the word is soteria, deliver me through your prayer and of course the Holy Spirit. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. There's vindication. Like Paul's not gonna be put to shame. Remember, he's on trial. He's awaiting to see Caesar where he possibly could be beheaded. Like there's all these accusations against the apostle Paul. His life is on the line. And he's saying, I have an earnest expectation. The word expectation is like what you do when you stretch your neck and you're like waiting for somebody to come home or you're waiting for somebody to walk through the door. That's the word earnest expectation. And he says, hope. So he's like hopeful that God is going to come through. Whether, ready for this? God is going to come through that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. He's saying God is going to come through whether he allows me to live or whether he calls me home through death. God is going to deliver me. God is going to vindicate me. Here's what we titled at the time, the best of both worlds, because I got stuck on that line. Whether through life or death, God is gonna be magnified? How do you say that? How do you come to a conclusion as a Christian that God is going to be made larger through my life and even my death? How do you get to that point? Well, I believe you have to have a proper theology on death. For the believer, the proper theology on death is recognizing, let me say this very slow, please. For the believer, there is no such thing as an untimely death. For the believer in Christ, there is no such thing as an accidental death. The Bible is very clear when it talks about my times are in your hands. All of the days that you have entrusted to me, Lord, you wrote down in a book <laughs> before my life even existed. That's what Psalms 139 says. Before I even took my first breath on earth, God already knew when I would take my last breath on earth. It blew my mind because the missionary, the at-risk missionary who was here last year, Victor Marks, 
when he's going into those hot areas in the Middle East to rescue kids that are suffering from the terroristic hands of ISIS, he said in his testimony, he goes, I'm operating in wisdom. I'm not being foolish. There's danger there. He said, but God has either numbered my days or he hasn't. And that hit me. I was like, wow, what am I doing with the breaths that God has given me right now? So a proper theology of death recognizes that in Christ, life and death are not enemies. They're allies. Life and death. They're not at war with one another. Because Christ conquered death, <laughs> took the sting out of it, death becomes, as Paul will write in the next verse, an upgrade. Because verse 21 says, for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's right. To live is Christ. Remember, we talked about, he's saying life is from Christ. Christ gave me life. All things were given by Christ. My life is from you. And if I recognize that, my life will then begin to live for Christ. If life is from Christ, then life should be lived for Christ. And then what about death? He says, death is gain. Death is profitable. That's crazy. Remember, I love thinking about the Apostle Paul. Here they are locking him up. Here they are threatening him with death. Yet nothing they could throw at him could shake him. What do you do with a man who you put chains on his hand and he goes, ah, this is working out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now I can convert every single jailer that's chained to me. We're going to threaten you with death. We're going to take your head off huh? to die is gain. What do you do with a person who has a proper theology about life and death? To live is Christ, to die is gain. And of course, we titled this The Tension Between Two Truths. Remember, way back when, we're talking about the struggle behind living and dying. And what's the proper balance between the two? He says, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. There's the tension. I, I want to live and help the church. It will be fruitful for my labor to help them. But I also, in verse 23, I'm hard-pressed between the two. I have a desire to depart and be with Christ. I want to go home. I want to go home. I don't know how many people in here long for that. A total release from sin and bondage and sin and, and all the things this world throws at us. This is not a suicidal thought. This is recognizing that heaven is our true home. As Billy Graham said, we are just passing through. Paul understood this. He's reconciling the two, life and death. I'm hard pressed between the two. I want to depart and be with Jesus, which is better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. What is he saying? With all of that, he is saying, Sometimes, and most of the time, it is wiser to choose what is necessary over what is desired. I desire every morning to sleep in, but it is necessary for me to get up. I desire to scroll through social media and see what all of you guys are doing, but it is necessary for me to put it down and prepare for the messages or the calling that God has given me in that day. Paul is saying, I desire to go home and be with God, of course, but it's necessary that I stay here and do the work that the Lord has called me to do. Point being this, when we behold the crucifixion, there's the first tension, the love of Christ pushes us. And when we behold the resurrection, the tomb, the hope of Christ pulls us. I believe that is the best balance for faith to grow. A balance behind the cross motivates me every day. When I think about Jesus Christ loves me in spite of me. There's nothing I could do that could ever separate me from the love of God in Christ. The cross exclaims that. That love pushes me. That love compels me. That love moves me. Then I think about the resurrection, that Jesus did what he said he would do, that he conquered death, that he rose from the dead three days later. So in him going to the cross, he died, he gave me life. And in him raising from the dead, 
he showed me that I should not fear even death because he is the resurrection and he is the life. And when I think about the tomb, it pulls me. Why? Because there's a hope that exists for the believer. Paul would write that if we don't have hope, we're the most pitiful people in the world. Here we are claiming a cross in an empty tomb. If that's not true, if that's not real, we are pitiful. But because it is true, because it has been validated by the empty tomb, the hope of heaven should pull me. So as the love of Christ pushes me, it is the hope of heaven that pulls me. And of course, verse 27 stood alone. We titled it, How Much Do You Weigh? We talked about the individual, of course, as Paul would pen, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you're standing face, fast in one spirit, with one mind you are striving together for the faith of the gospel. Quickly, we read these verses, and it's healthy to do so with the understanding that I want my conduct to be worthy of the gospel, right? That's the individual application. But let's keep in mind, when Paul wrote this letter, he was writing to the church at large. So though it's a personal application, it's also a corporate application. So I asked the question, how much does coastal Christian weigh when placed on the scriptures? How much of what we're doing on any given Thursday or weekend balances out with the truth? That's a very real question that church leaders should actually ask themselves every day. Is this initiative we are introducing biblical? Is this worship series out of God's word and not just because the culture is doing it, not because a very popular and growing church that is famous is doing it? That's not the indication that we should be doing it from this platform. The indication that we should be doing it from this platform has to come out of God's word. How much do we weigh on the scriptures, the scales of scriptures? Biblical conduct needs to be based on the Bible. Because to wear the name of Christian, I said this, is to bear the nature of Christ. And that's even the church. To be identified as a Christian church, we should be bearing the nature of Jesus Christ in the community. Here's the point. A healthy church or Christian makes it a priority to be profitable. Hmm. When I use the word profitable, I'm talking about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, all scripture is given by the breath of God for profitable, that we would be profitable, that we would be enriched, that we would be made spiritually whole. For what? The word of God is profitable for teaching, doctrine. The word of God is profitable for reproof, conviction. The word of God is profitable for correction. The word of God is profitable for instruction in the things of righteousness. Why? That the man or woman of God may be complete, mature, thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's the true definition of profit. To be profitable in the word of God, how much do you weigh? And then finally, verses 28 through 30, these were the most recent messages, suffering successfully, we titled it. Let me read it, and then we'll talk about it, and then we will close. He says, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. Remember, I wanna hear this about you, that you are sticking together in one spirit, you're striving together in one mind, and you're not intimidated by your adversaries, which is to them a proof that they're damned, but it's a proof that you're saved. Because to know you belong to eternity is to not be spooked by what is temporary. Nothing that is temporary should shake the Christian. And that's proof. When somebody sees you supernaturally respond to suffering, they are convinced, dang, I'm doomed. And that person saved. And of course, Paul would then write, for to you, it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. We don't like that. We do not like that verse. You wanna know why? Because it just got done telling me that it is a gracious gift of God to allow suffering in my life. Suffering cannot be considered a gift. So a gift is something I want. A gift is something that I should cherish and unwrap and use 
Yet in the word of God, if we were to rip the pages of suffering out of scripture, we would be completely erasing the redeeming nature of the Savior. Do you ever think of that? God chose suffering as the means to accomplish salvation. God allowed his own son to suffer so he could learn obedience. So why would not God allow us, his children, to suffer? Now, we talked about suffering accomplishing several different things. We first had to wrap our hearts around this truth that where suffering comes from is not nearly as important as what suffering comes for. Like where it came from, like why am I going through this? Don't worry about that. Ask yourself, God, why am I going through this? Why did you allow this? What did it come for? What do you want to accomplish through this suffering? I said five different reasons. Suffering will enable us to see Jesus. Suffering will enable us to see Jesus. Suffering will enable you to see God clearer. Suffering exposes sin in us. Sometimes I don't know that there's sin, unanswered sin in my life until I suffer and then it comes to the surface. Why wouldn't God allow that to expose sin in me that I didn't know was in me? Suffering also, this is the best one, educates us to sympathize with others. It is a gift of suffering that you can relate to people that are struggling, suffering, and hurting. You can relate to them because you've gone through it. That's a gift that we can empathize with a broken world because we've gone through it too. Theodore Roosevelt said, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Suffering engages us into sanctification with God. Suffering detaches me from the world and attaches me to God takes me out of the worldliness and it places me into godliness. Suffering actually sanctifies. Suffering shapes and forms and ultimately suffering exercises our salvation to the world. Every single soul is suffering day by day. Everyone everywhere Every age is suffering day by day. The moment we are born, we begin dying. Did you know that? We are getting closer to departure. There are two camps. There are those who are gonna suffer miserably. Then there's the believer who has a hope which allows them to suffer successfully. When I think of suffering successfully, I think of so many people from this congregation. I think of one recently, of course, in Herb Stubbs. He suffered successfully. He was dying, but he understand the process of dying was allowing him to get closer to Jesus. And in death, it would be gain. That's powerful. That motivates. That testifies. That encourages. That proves salvation is real. So I believe Verse 30, we'll close this out. Having the same conflict, Paul writes, which you saw in me and now here is in me. He's saying, you guys are experiencing the same agony that you saw in me when I was with you 10 years prior. And now you hear that same agony is in me today. The word agony or conflict was describing a Greek contest. They called it an agon or the location where they would perform their athletics, an agon. It's where we get the English word agony. And he's saying the agony, the agony will always produce glory. The most agonized, agonizing, agonizing, agonizing thing you will ever experience in your life, the most painful thing you will ever experience in your life will lead to the most fruit you will ever experience in your life. Your greatest pain will produce your greatest purpose. So we go backwards to go forward. We review to renew. I believe, of course, memorization is the offspring of repetition. The more we go through scriptures and we don't rush just to get to another chapter, we don't rush just to get to another verse, just for the sake of saying I've completed another book, but we take time to do what the Bible says, meditate. Meditation is not just contemplation, thinking about it. Meditation leads to practical application and doing something about it. All scripture is given by God's breath and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for the instruction of righteousness that you and I may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. God bless you guys.
As a church, we believe it's our job to connect our community to Christ. So if Matthew's message impacted you in any way, we'd like to invite you to take part in our mission and share this message with friends and family. We'll see you next week.